Amen. The Lord our God told his people in the book of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, the Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and to give you a future. Listen to that. Some of you know that passage of Scripture. This is the Lord God speaking to his people. He says again, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and to give you a future. Now, here's something that we need to know and understand about that passage of Scripture. I want you to understand the context of that passage of Scripture. The Lord said that to his people as he is about to send his people into captivity. The Lord says this to his people. I know the plans that I have for you. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you, to give you a hope, and to give you a future. He says this to his people as he is about to send them into captivity. He says this to them as he is about to send them through trials and tribulations. And this is what we're going to be seeing and talking about in today's study. And so with those things in mind, let's go ahead and begin reading. Let's begin reading right there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We pick up our systematic study right there in verse 7. And it says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, Therefore, I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit. So that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, he says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outraise them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Stop right there, if you will. Let me have your attention. Because there's a lot that's going on in that passage of Scripture that speaks to us. Speaks to us. I reminded you a couple of weeks ago how that everything that's written in the Bible is written for our benefit. And so there's a lot of things that the Lord is saying here that, again, are for our benefit. Now, what we looked at here today what we've read here today can be broken down into three parts. And the three parts are these. Number one, trials and tribulations of life. Number two, what our attitude should be towards those trials and tribulations. And number three, how to overcome those tribulations. Again, what we read can be broken down into three parts. I know this is not in your notes, but please go ahead and write this down because this is important. Number one, the trials and tribulations of life. Number two, what our attitude should be towards those trials and tribulations. And number three, how to overcome those trials and tribulations. 
So here's the deal. The more we understand something, the better we can deal with that something. Amen? The more we understand something, the better we can deal with that something. Now, before we begin to really look at those things that I just broke down there, I want you to see something. I want you to notice something, and that is that the Apostle Paul tells us that as Christians that we have something valuable inside of us. That as Christians, we have this treasure inside of us. And what is the treasure? Christ, the hope of glory. Christ, the hope of glory. See, understand something. If you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you have received the indwelling of the Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit comes and does, number one is this. He marks us and he seals us as God's possession. Again, when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and he marks us and seals us as God's possession. I told you before how that when God looks down from heaven, he knows those who are his by his spirit. Not because they go to this church or because they go to that church. Not because they have a bumper sticker, I love Jesus. Not because they wear a big two-foot cross on their neck. No. God knows those who are his by his spirit. And so again, the first thing the Holy Spirit does is he comes inside of us. He dwells inside of us and he marks us and he seals us as God's possession. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, and you probably won't even appreciate this, but I'm going to tell it to you anyhow. And that is that you and I, on our best days, are nothing but dignified dirt. You and I, on our best days, is nothing more than dignified dirt. Some of you know the story in the book of Genesis, how that after God created the heavens and earth, he reached down into the dirt, and he got some dirt, and he formed it, and he fashioned it into a man, and then he put life into that man. So you and I, on our best days, is nothing more than dignified dirt. And here's why it's important that we understand these type of things. First of all, we need to know again that the treasure that God has put inside of these jars of clay is actually what gives the clay worth. It's the treasure that God has put inside of these jars of clay that actually gives the clay worth. See, it's important that we know that. See, because sometimes we, as human beings, and sometimes we, even as Christians, we think that we're bringing worth to the table in and of ourselves. Sometimes we think that God looks down from heaven and look at us and go, oh, man, if I can just get him on my team. Oh, man, if I can just get her on my team. Oh, man, talking about having a dream team. Man, I have a dream team, says the Lord. No, 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 no. That is not how it is. Listen to and remember, always remember what the Bible tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 through 29, it says this, that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. And so God didn't choose us because we were so wise. God chose us because we were so foolish. God didn't choose us to bring um, worth to his team. God chose us to bring worth to ourselves. Are you listening? And so again, when we understand those things and hold on to those things, then we always stay in a place where we can receive from the Lord. 
It's because sometimes, again, as human beings, and even as Christians, sometimes, man, the Lord takes us and the Lord finds us and the Lord begins to uh, uh, do some great things in our lives and the Lord begins to use us. And sometimes we forget. We forget. We think that we're in that place, that we're in that position because of ourselves. And man, especially when we start memorizing some scripture verses. Oh, man, I know this scripture verse, and I know that verse, and I know that verse. Man, sometimes we can get puffed up. The Bible says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And here's the thing about getting built up in God's love. When you get built up in God's love, you stay humble because you know you're only built up by God's love. And when you're built up by God's love and you're in a humble position, guess what you do? You stay on your knees. And when you stay on your knees, guess what? It's hard to fall when you're on your knees. You know that? It is hard to fall when you're on our knees. And so, again, God chose us not because we were so wise, but because we're so foolish. God chose us not so that we can bring value to his team, But he chose us so that he could bring value to us. Now, because God chose us, because God put his treasure inside of these jars of clay, one of the main things that we ought to do with this clay is this. We ought to keep it clean and empty and available for the master's use. Because God took his treasure and put it inside of us, these jars of clay. One of the main things, again, that we ought to do with these jars of clay is, again, we ought to keep them clean and empty and available for the master's use. And not just clean on the outside, but still on the inside being full of dead man's bones. But we need to clean the outside of the cup as well as the inside of the cup. cup. We are to maintain purity in and out. And therefore, the Bible tells us this. And write this scripture down. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, I urge you in view of God's mercy, to present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing, and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable service, as the King James would say. The New Bible says your spiritual act of worship. See, because of all that God has done, it's only reasonable that we should serve him in, this, in that way. It's only reasonable, again, that we should take these jars of clay and keep them clean and empty and available for the master's use. And when we do this, a wonderful thing takes place. And we just read it. When we do that, what it shows is that all of this a passing power is from God and not from us. And what that means is this. When people begin to see how that God took these broken vessels, when God took these broken vessels, when God takes these broken lives, when God takes these foolish people and he begins to shape them and mold them and transform them and conform them into the image of Jesus Christ. When people see us and, who, and people who know us see that, they go, man, that ain't nobody but Jesus And therefore, God gets the glory. God gets the glory. Now, one of the ways that the glory of God shines forth through our lives is, and we don't like this, but here's the truth of this, is through trials and tribulations, which is why the Apostle Paul says what he says there in verse 8. Look, if you will, at what Paul says there in verse 8, Paul says, for we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Abandoned, I mean, I'm sorry, perse- perplexed, brother, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake 
so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. First thing that Paul wants us to know about trials and tribulations is this. That God permits them, that God uses them, and that God controls them. He wants us to know this. He wants us to understand this. And we need to grasp this. Again, God permits trials and tribulations. God uses them, and he controls them. Case in point, some of you know the story. Job. If you don't know the story of Job, open up your Bible when you get home and read the story of Job. It's found in the book of Job. Not the book of Job, but the book of Job. Here's Job's story. Job going along. Job doing good. In fact, Job is living his best life. He's living his best life. Job got it going on. And God says to Satan, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him in all of the land. To which Satan says, hey, the only reason why you serve, I mean, why he serves you is because you give him everything. The only reason why he serves you is because you have a hedge of protection around him. Remove the hedge and let me get at him. And I'll make him curse you to your face. And God says, what? Have at it. So what happens? What is that? God permitted the trial. God permitted the tribulation. But God also used it and he controlled it because he told Satan this far, but no further. So God, again, God permits trials, he uses trials, and he controls trials. So what we need to know and learn about trials and tribulations is this, from our point of view. Here's how God uses them in our lives. First of all, he uses them to strengthen our faith, to transform our character, to grow us in godliness, but also to impact the lives of those who are around us. Let me say that again. God uses trials. God uses tribulations in our lives, first of all, to again, to strengthen our faith. To strengthen our faith, but also to transform our character. But also, again, to grow us in godliness, but then also to use our lives to impact the lives of people who are around us. See, God is so, so wise. God is so much above us. At any given point in your life, at any given point in my life, God is doing more than 10,000 things at one time, and we're lucky if we see one or two of them. God is doing more than 10 thousand times at any given point in our lives, but we're lucky if we see one or two of them. God, again, is so, so big and and so above us that he actually says this. Some of you know this passage of Scripture found in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 55 and verses 8 and 9, the Lord says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And to show you the truth of that, some of you, like me, have gone through some horrific trials and tribulations, even in your Christian walk. And man, I came to the Lord, man, I thought it was going to be easy peasy. Man, I never went through so many tough times, so much hard time, and so much tribulation in all of my life. But here's the deal. Many of you, again, like me, have gone through some horrific trials and tribulations in your Christian walk. And if you haven't gone through them, then guess what? It's coming. It's coming. And here's why. 
Because, again, God uses those things to strengthen our faith. He uses those things to transform our character. He uses those things to help us, to teach us to walk in holiness. But he's also using those things in your life and in my life to impact the lives of other people who are around us. But again, it shows you the truth of how God's ways are so much higher than our ways and his thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. Again, many of you like me have gone through horrific trials and tribulations in your life. And in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that tribulation, you were going, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to survive. This is it. I am literally going to die. All of my dreams, all of my plans, all of my ambitions, it's over. It's crush and die and burn time. But not only did you not die, not only did you survive, you came through that trial, you came through that tribulation, you came out on the other side better for having gone through there. Amen? Now, that doesn't mean anybody want to sign up to go through it again. Amen? Because, I mean, when you're in, it's like, God, get me out of here, get me out of here, get me out of here. But when you're in the midst of the fire, God got his hand on the thermostat. Always remember that. You know, how, how was it with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Or as Tony Evans would say, the bad Negro. He was right with them in the midst of the fire. And in the midst of the fire, what did he do? He burned off the bands that was binding them. Remember, they binded them and they threw them in the fire. So in the fire, they won't harm. He loosed them. And so again, here you were, you were in this trial, you were in this tribulation, it was hard, it was miserable, it was, I mean, just death all the way through. And you're standing crying, God, where are you? God, where are you? God, you said you would never leave me, never forsake me. God, where are you? God, don't you see what's going on? God, I can't take this. Lord, you said you would never put more on me than I'm able to bear, and God, I can't bear this. Anybody? Can I get a witness? Ever been there? And I mean, you just crying and, and your heart is just breaking and your heart is weeping. And sometimes we begin to act like Job's accusers. Remember Job's accusers? They accused Job of saying, Job, you must have done something wrong. You must have done something wrong because otherwise you wouldn't be in here. And so they were actually saying that they knew more than God. So here we are again. And again, if you haven't been there, Again, you're going there, and you need to hear this. You need to know this so that you can hold on to this. Because like I said before, the more you understand something, the more you can deal with that something. As the Bible says again, there is no temptation that comes onto man that's not common to man. And again, if you are a child of God, again, God's main thing that he's trying to do in all of our lives, lives is, is to shape us and to mold us and to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Do you know that the Bible says that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered? But why is it again that we as Christians, we think it's everything that's supposed to be so easy and peasy? So in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that tough place, In the midst of that place where, again, you're thinking that I'm not going to survive. I'm not going to survive. I'm not going to get out. I'm not going to make it out. It's too big. This is the death of me. Many of us, again, not only survived, but we came out on the other side. Better off of having gone through that. And so what that means is this, that God was with us in the midst of the fire. That God was in the midst of the fire. That again, he was using that for our benefit. And so again, what we need to know and understand again, that God, again, allows those type of things for our benefit, but also for the benefit of others. 
And so what should we be doing in the midst of those trials? What should we be doing in the midst of that pain? We should be proclaiming the word of God. We should be speaking the word of God to those situations, which is what we see, again, the Apostle Paul telling us to do. Look again, if you will, in verse 13. Verse 13, Paul says, it is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we, notice that, since we, he's talking about all of us who have received Jesus Christ, since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, therefore, he says, Therefore, I like that. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, he says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Talking about a statement of faith. That is a statement of faith. Paul says, I believe, and therefore I speak. I believe, and therefore I speak. In other words, in the midst of those heavy trials, in the midst of those heavy tribulations, in the midst of walking through the valley, of the shadow of death, we need to speak God's word to those situations as we wait for God to show up in those situations. Are you listening? In the midst of those trials, in the midst of those tribulations, we need to speak God's word to those situations as a way for God to show up in those situations And we need to also remember that everything that we're going through is temporal, but the eternal is coming. Everything we're going through is temporal, but what's coming is eternal. Did you notice how Paul said these light and momentary troubles? Man, when you know Paul's life, you have to say, man, how could he say that? How could he say that? Remember, this guy had been beaten over and over and over again. This guy had been shipwrecked, left out in the sea. This guy had been stoned several different times. Everywhere he went, people were trying to put him to death. Everywhere. He was in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger by a Gentiles, in danger by the Jews. Everywhere this man went, people were trying to kill him. But what did he say? These light and momentary troubles. Wow. You think somebody talking about life and momentary troubles, man, they got it going on. They sitting back on a bed of ease. You know, the big thing they're dealing with, oh, girl, I broke my nail. No, this guy is going through. Again, everywhere he's going, think about that. Not just here or there, but everywhere he's going, people are trying to kill him. He would go into a place, go into a city, start up a church, and immediately people coming right behind him trying to tear it down and steal the uh, disciples. They're talking about him, saying he's not even an apostle. Again, the man's being beaten, beaten with rods. 
The man had the 40 lashes minus one. And understand, when we're talking about lashes, it's not just talking about somebody with a whip. It's talking about what a cat of nine tails. And in case you don't know what a cat of nine tails is, it's a handle with nine leather straps off of that. The straps are about two inches thick and two inches wide. And inside of them, there is bone, there is glass, there is metal. Your back is stripped open. And they will hit you with this thing and rake it across your back. Light. 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 Momentary troubles. Hmm. If you never read the book of Fox, uh, Fox's book of Martyrs, please read it. Read it. Because, again, it's a book that will really help you to see that, again, a lot of stuff that we're going through, man, not even really worth mentioning. But, again, here it is. Paul says, again, they had light and momentary troubles. Listen to what the apostle said in the book of Romans. Same apostle Paul. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 18, Paul says, I do not consider our present sufferings. They're not worth Comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. So what Paul is telling us and what the Spirit is telling us is that again in the midst of the trials and tribulations, again, the way that we overcome these trials and tribulations is by focusing in on the eternal. Focusing in on the eternal. Trials and tribulations, inevitable, because God shapes us, and God moves us, and God makes us into the image of Jesus through that. What should our attitude be because of those things? None of these things move me. None of these things move me. I will not be moved. I know that my Redeemer lives. I will not be moved. And because we know whom we believe, again, in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that tribulation, we speak the word of God to that trial. We speak the word of God to that tribulation as we wait in faith for the Lord to show up. And Paul says, again, the way that we can do that, the way that we can continue to move forward in the midst of all of that is, again, by looking forward forward by focusing in on the eternal things that are to come and not the temporal things. See, Paul, Paul knew that there was life after death because Paul had seen the risen Lord. He's seen the risen Lord, right? He saw him on the road to Damascus, but after that, the Lord actually spent three years with the Apostle Paul teaching him as the other apostles walked with the Lord on the earth for three years and he gave them wisdom and he gave them knowledge and he gave them insight. He took Paul, the Bible says, on the road, not on the road, on, uh, in, in, the, in the desert. He took Paul out there in the desert, and for three years, he spoke to him. He told him, he taught him how, again, all the pictures and the types and the shadows of the Old Testament were fulfilled in Christ. So he knew absolutely positively that there was life after death. But he also had gone to the third heaven. He had gone to the very abode of God where he saw things, where he heard things which he said were unlawful for even to speak about. And so what he said to us is, and again he says the same thing in several other different passages of Scripture. Write this down. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, Paul says, Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. 
Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. Now, please do not think for any moment that Paul is just saying, oh, man, what you're going through is not tough. Do not think that he's saying what you're going through is not hard. Do not think that he's just saying, oh, man, you know, buck up, man up. No, he understands that those things were hard. He understands that those things were difficult. But he also says again that the way that we can walk through those things is by opening our eyes by faith to the eternal things of God. See, if Paul had simply focused in on the things that were around him, if he had simply focused in on the things that he was going through, he could have been and would have been greatly discouraged. If anybody had a reason to mumble and grumble and complain, it was Paul. Paul could have easily said, Lord, this is what I get for serving you. This is what I receive from serving you. Everywhere I go, people are trying to kill me. I've been beaten. I've been shipwrecked. I've been stoned. I've been imprisoned over and over and over and over again. Not because I'm doing anything wrong, but I'm following you. I'm doing everything that you asked me to do to the best of my ability. Lord, you know my heart. You hear my words, oh God. You know I'm not a whiner. You know I'm not a wimp. I'm trying to be strong, Lord, but this is too much. Lord, if this is how you're going to treat your servant, you know what? I'm out. I don't need this. And if you would be honest with yourself, I'm pretty sure you felt that way sometime or another in your own walk with the Lord. You know, where you're working, you're serving, you're doing this, you're doing that, and man, things are just not coming together. And sometimes you're just going, you know what? I don't need this. I can do better by myself. I'm trying to do right, people hating on me. I'm trying to do good, people putting me down. You know what? I don't need this. Well, if this is how you're going to treat your servant, I quit. But by Paul looking forward to the eternal things, he was able to get through those temporal things. So instead of him being discouraged, he was encouraged. By him looking at the temporal things, knowing that they are temporal, in light of the eternal glorious things, the greater things which were to come, instead of him being discouraged, he was encouraged. He continued to have the mindset of, yeah, yeah, it's tough, but oh, man, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, all of these trials, all of these temptations, there's going to be no more death. There's going to be no more pain. There's going to be no more sorrow. All of these things are going to be over. As the old Jamaican song says, it's soon be done. It's soon be done. All my troubles and trials. When I get home to the other side, I'm going to tell all the people good morning, sit down beside my Jesus, sit down and rest a little while. See, by I get him keeping his eyes on the eternal, he was able to deal with the temporal. And again, we've all been there. As a pastor, man, if I was to just focus in on the temporal, I wouldn't be here. 
There's been so many things that have come up in the ministry over the years that has discouraged my heart. There's been so many things that, you know, this, this hurt me and broke me down, and I'm going, God, if this is all we're going to do, I quit. I'm tired, Lord. I'm tired. Hmm. God, I want to go home. I'm tired. But again, that's the temporal. But when you see the eternal, it gets you through that. Let me say this to you, and we're done. Write this down, please. Sorrow looks back. Worry looks around. But faith looks forward. Sorrow looks back. Worry looks around, but faith looks forward. The sorrow looks back, and sorrow says, if I woulda, coulda, shoulda. Oh, man, if only I had said this instead of saying that. If only I had gone here and not have gone there. Sorrow looks back. Worry looks around. Worry goes, oh, man, look at this. And look at that. What if this doesn't happen? And what if that doesn't happen? Or what if this does happen? Or what if that does happen? Worry looks around, but faith looks forward. Faith says, none of these things move me. None of these things move me. Mm. God again permits trials. He uses trials. And he controls trials. Remember, he's right there in the fire. And he always has a hand on the thermostat. He controls the temperature. And when he has done the work that he wants to do, he will let you out. And when you come out, you will find yourself being better off for having gone through that than you were when you went in that. And that's when you know that 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 he is a good, good father. He is a good, good father. Amen. So let me give you some things uh, to go home with, some things to apply. See, because... My job, and the job of the elders in this church is, is to help you to move forward in faith. We love the fact that you come and that you listen. But listening is not enough. We must be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Do you know what the Bible actually says it's better not to know the way than to know the way and don't go the way? And so, again, we give you things every week. We give you things every week, some lessons to go home with, some challenges. And we don't just give you these things to take up some space on paper. We don't just give you these things as some clever thoughts. Well, we give you these things so that you can add something to your repertoire. Every week, you should be walking away with here with at least one thing that you say, you know what? I am going to apply this this week. I see, the thing is, growing in Christ is like going up steps. It's one at a time. Every now and then, especially when you were younger, you may be to take two steps at a time. But it's little by little. 
And the growing again is not automatic. It's you have to take what you hear and you have to apply it. As you apply it, you go up. You can come every day of the week and listen and listen and listen. You can have a perfect attendance record and don't get an education. We have several school teachers in here, and they know that to be true. There's a lot of kids that show up week after week, month after month, but they never apply what they learn, and so they don't grow. And so, again, I'm going to give you some things that you can take home, some things that you can apply. Number one, these are our key takeaways from today's study. Number one, that as Christians, we are to keep our bodies, our earthly vessels, clean and empty and available for God's use. We are to keep our bodies, our earthly vessels, clean and empty and available for God's use. Number two, God permits, uses, and controls trials for our good. He permits them, he uses them, and he controls them for our good. Number three, we overcome the temporal things of today by focusing in on the eternal things of tomorrow. This week, I guarantee you, something's going to jump up in your world. Something's going to come and it's going to try to bring you despair. Something's going to come up and say, focus in on this thing here. You have to look past that, look past the temporal to the eternal. And here's our challenge for the week. This week's challenge is to do at least one thing to help to promote the kingdom of God. Just one thing. See if, again, you drop a seed, I drop a seed, we drop a seed, somebody else comes by and put some water on that seed, somebody else comes by and cultivate that seed, somebody else comes by and put some light on that seed, then there's a harvest. But just one thing. Again, God's not asking us to do these great, big, monumental things. He's asking us to just take some small steps of faith. So I want you to find one thing, one thing this week. We're going to challenge you. We're going to ask you next week. What was your one thing? What did you do? You should be able to say, I did such and such. See, it might seem small. But in the collective, it's a big thing. Can we all stand, please?